welcome back folks to the second part of my swashbuckler review. I'm Frizz, and today I'm going to be going over every single swashbuckler feed currently released in Pathfinder 2e. In the previous part of this, I went over all the class features that swashbucklers get access to, and more about the class overall, so I really do recommend that you check that video out if you haven't already. You don't need to have seen it to understand everything that I will say in this video, but I will be referring to class features that I have gone over previously, so you might lose a bit of context. Let's just jump right into it though, since this video is already going to be stupidly long. Buckler Expertise is a simple defensive feat that brings bucklers up to par with other shields. It increases the circumstance bonus to your AC from raising a buckler from a plus 1 to a plus 2. Bucklers still aren't going to be as good as other shields in terms of shield blocking due to them having a lower hardness and hit point, but now you won't be penalized for using one, and there are other benefits for using a buckler. The predominant one is that it allows you to have that strapped onto an arm, but still be able to use that hand for other actions, like if, say, you need to open a door or grab a potion. Also, for gymnast swashbucklers, you need to have a hand free to perform grapple, trip, or shove actions, so using a normal shield would, would prohibit you from even doing that if you have a weapon in your other hand. Overall, this makes bucklers much, much more mechanically viable. Disarming Flare makes the disarm action far, far more useful, as it makes the outcome on a success affect enemies far more often. Normally, all that succeeding on a disarm attempt does is apply a penalty on attack rolls with that weapon, and a penalty on their safety C versus additional disarm attempts. The issue is that, under normal circumstances, these penalties only last till the beginning of the enemy's turn, meaning that that penalty on attack rolls will only actually impact the enemy if they make a attack as a reaction. Disarming Flare makes this far more useful though, as whenever you succeed on an athletics check to disarm, the penalties last until the end of your next turn, which is far more useful as now the target will suffer those penalties on at least one of their turns. They can use an interact action to remove these penalties early though, but that can always risk triggering an attack of opportunity. Also. This is even better for Gymnasts, as Disarming Flare allows for you to get Panache through Disarm. So now you can get it from Trip, Grapple, Shove, and Disarm, which is a lot of different ways for you to get Panache, in addition to kind of debuffing enemies. It gives you a great amount of versatility, and it makes Disarming an actually really viable option for all types of Swashbucklers. Dueling Parry is incredibly simple. You can spend an action when you have a single one-handed weapon out and then nothing in your other hand to get a plus two circumstance bonus to your AC until the beginning of your next turn. This is equivalent to raising a shield, but you can't use it to shield block. That boost to your AC can be incredibly helpful, as anyone who has used a shield can tell you, and it should really not be overlooked. You probably won't have the action economy to use this every turn, but it can really help you out when you need it. Sometimes you'll be in a risky situation, and having that boost to your survivability will always be nice. Flying Blade is one of the most interesting swashbuckler feats, and you can get it at level 1. Normal swashbucklers are frontline combatants, as none of their features work with any kind of ranged weapon, but Flying Blade allows for you to use throwing weapons with pretty much all of your class features. Basically, all of the bonus precision damage from Precise Strike can now be used with thrown weapons in your first range increment, given that the weapon also has the Agile or the Finesse trait. This means that you can use finishers within your first range increment, which is such a good benefit, especially if you're dealing with an enemy that flies. Most swashbucklers don't have many options to use at range outside of just closing the, the distance normally, so having Flying Blade can really open up your opportunities. Star Knives are a great weapon for this, considering that they have a decent range and the deadly trait but you can make pretty much any thrown weapon fit. Also, you don't have to build your entire character around being a ranged swashbuckler. It can simply be a tool in your toolbox. This is not me saying that you shouldn't build a strictly ranged swashbuckler, because I find that idea to be really interesting. Focus Fascination is a really interesting feat, as it directly improves fascinating performance. 
If you're going to be taking Focused Fascination, you're likely a battle dancer, and this makes the chance of successfully fascinating someone much, much higher. Now, as long as you're only targeting one creature with fascinating performance, you fascinate on a success versus their will DC rather than a critical success. This, unfortunately, doesn't get around my main issue with Fascinate, which is that unless everyone in your party is willing to go along with it, it breaks the instant anything hostile happens. But if you've got a cooperative party, that can be mitigated. Also, if you're using this against a higher level enemy, it still does have the incapacitation trait, meaning that you will have to critically succeed against them to fascinate them. It is a really interesting addition to your tool set, though, and it can be useful if used correctly. Goading Feint changes up the effects of the Feint action, and it requires that you're trained with Deception, which is a pretty fair requirement considering that it, it only affects Feint, which is a Deception-based action. Rather than making the enemy flat-footed for a varying amount of time depending on your success, you instead trick your opponent into making mistakes, reducing their attack rolls. If you succeed on a Deception check versus their Perception DC, they take a minus two circumstance penalty on their next attack roll against you before the end of their next turn. If you critically succeed against their Perception DC, th then those penalties apply to all attack rolls it makes until the end of its next turn. This is a great way to improve your own survivability, as there aren't really all that ways to apply a circumstance penalty on attack rolls, so this is almost certainly going to be stacking. Also, using Goading Fate increases the odds of the target critically failing attacks against you, which means once you hit level 3, you're going to be much more likely to be able to use Opportune Repose to stab back at them. All around, Goading Fate is a great way to improve your own survivability and to be able to use Deception in situations where a target is already flat-footed. If you are, for instance, already flanking with someone, there's no reason to faint against them already, because they're already on a flank. But if you have Goading Faint, then you do have a reason to do it, because you can apply that penalty on their attack rolls, even if you don't need to make them flat-footed. Nimble Dodge is the first reaction that a swashbuckler can get access to, and it can be incredibly useful. Whenever a creature that you can see targets you with an attack, you can spend your reaction to get a plus 2 circumstance bonus to your AC as you try and dodge out of the way of the attack. This won't stack with any other circumstance bonuses that you may have, but it is a great way to improve your AC a bit against one attack around. As you'll see, though, Nimble Dodge does have a lot of competition when it comes to defensive reactions, so you might not be able to use it every single turn, as you might prefer to use a different reaction. I'm getting a bit of ahead of myself, though. I'll just leave it at this. Nimble Dodge is a very good feat, and you can't go wrong by taking it. One for All is a great feat for all swashbucklers, but especially wit swashbucklers. If you're trained to diplomacy, then you can take this feat and then use an action to encourage an ally, saying something that, you know, encourages them to give it their all. And upon spending this action, you are prepared to aid them on whatever they're about to do. Meaning that whenever they do that, you can spend a reaction to aid them, using diplomacy instead of anything else that might actually be relevant to whatever they're doing. This means that you can use One For All to aid a wizard on an Arcana check to identify a magical effect, but you don't have to be trained in Arcana to help them with that. You can just use Diplomacy. And aid has a flat DC 20, meaning that once you get maybe to level 4 or 5, you're almost certainly going to be succeeding on that check. Now, I said that this was especially good for Wit Swashbucklers, because if you're a Wit Swashbuckler and your Diplomacy check meets the very hard DC for your level, you get Panache. I mentioned in the previous video that Wit Swashbucklers suffer from having to rely on having a shared language with their opponent, because Bon Mal requires a shared language. If you take one for all, then all you need to get Panache is now a shared language with your allies, which is almost certainly going to be the case. This means that regardless of what enemy you're fighting, you will be able to get Panache from them, which is not something that every style can say. The aid action is also very, very useful, and 
this isn't only good in combat, so you can use one for all to help a wizard get up a cliff, or to really just use it on any roll. This is a very, very strong feat, both for in-combat reasons and out-of-combat ones. The final level 1 feat is Your Next. It gives you a reaction that you can use whenever you reduce an enemy to zero hit points. Upon spending that reaction, you can immediately make an intimidation check to demoralize an enemy with a plus two circumstance bonus on the intimidation check. Additionally, if you have legendary intimidation, you don't actually have to spend a reaction on it, it's just a free action. This is a really nice way to get panache back for Brackert Swashbucklers, as once you use a finisher, there's a pretty decent chance you're going to finish off your opponent. Then immediately upon being... Then immediately after you knock them down, you can immediately demoralize someone, meaning that you get panache back immediately. You might not be able to finish someone off every single fight, but when you can, it is a pretty nice boost to your power. Have you ever complained about constantly rolling low for initiative? Well, now you can get benefits for doing it, or rather, just not rolling initiative in the first place. The After You feat allows for you to volunteer to just not roll initiative, instead you simply go last. But when it gets around to being your turn, you instantly enter Panache. This is a really great way to get Panache, especially in combats where you're going to be fighting against higher level enemies. It can be really hard to beat the higher level enemies' save DCs with your skills to get Panache normally, so after you is a great way to get Panache easily once per combat. And once you, you know, get past the first round, initiative doesn't matter a significant amount, and you can always choose to roll initiative normally. So if you're in a situation where you really do need to, you know, go quickly in a combat, you can do that if you need to. Antagonize is one of the only taunt-like mechanics in Pathfinder 2e that I know of, and it can be very frustrating for enemies to deal with. Whenever you successfully demoralize a creature, its frightened condition can't decrease below 1 at the end of its turn unless it uses a hostile action against you, so generally that's going to be some sort of attack or a spell. Also, it does go away if it doesn't know where you are or can't observe you for at least one round. As I've said time and time again, both Frightened and Demoralized are very, very useful, and if you are trained in Intimidate, they're pretty important to utilize. So getting an additional benefit to using Demoralize is always going to be great. It's also very good for Braggart Swashbucklers, because you're going to be demoralizing a lot of people. Do be careful about using it, though, since you'll be putting a big target on your back, because generally people will be wanting to... Uh, to get rid of the frightened condition, so they're going to be attacking you. Charmed Life is an incredibly powerful defensive reaction that allows for you to get a plus two circumstance bonus on any saving throw, as long as you have at least a 14 charisma. You do have to declare before you roll your save, though, that you're going to be using Charmed Life, and if you do that, then you just get a plus two on the save. The main power of this is the frequency. Bonuses to saving throws like this are pretty few and far between, and most of the ways that you can get a kind of bonus like this has some kind of frequency limitation. And Charmed Life has none of that, so you can do this every single round. Also, Charmed Life can be further improved later on, but we'll get to that whenever we get to the level 18 feats. Just bottom line, Charmed Life is incredibly powerful, and it can offset a lot of the weaknesses that all swashbucklers will have, like their fort and will saves. The first uncommon feat of this video is Fane's Forbury, and I love it so much, guys. It is a stance that you can take where you choose a deck of cards in your possession that you can now treat as either daggers or darts, the choice being made every single time that you enter the stance. You can then use these cards however you would normally be able to use daggers or darts, and you can even apply runes onto each deck. I personally don't feel like this is unreasonably powerful to give to players. So, if you are a GM watching this, I really encourage allowing players to be able to take this. If a wizard can cast magic and fireballs and all that stuff, it doesn't require stretching the imagination too much to allow for people to use cards to fight. Plus, how else are you going to play Gambit? 
Finishing follow through is a really interesting feat that changes how you're going to be using your finishers significantly. Now, if you bring a target to 0 HP with a finisher, you immediately gain panache, meaning that you don't have to go through the whole rigmarole of getting panache again. This means that rather than using panache to do large amounts of damage to pretty healthy targets, you're probably going to be prioritizing using finishers to finish off weaker targets or lower level creatures or pretty much you just want to finish people off. This means that you can go around combats finishing off low health enemy or low level enemies and just keep on chaining together finishers turn after turn without having to worry about getting panache every couple of rounds. This is going to be a lot more useful in campaigns where fights against large numbers of enemies are common though, and single enemy combats won't give you any benefit for having this feat at all. It can save you a lot of action economy if you utilize it to its full extent. Tumble through is already one of the best ways that you can get panache, and tumble behind makes tumble through even better. Now, whenever you successfully tumble through, the target is flat-footed towards your next attack before the end of your turn. This makes the cycle of tumbling through an opponent, then immediately using a finisher on them even more effective, since the target is flat-footed now. If you have a friend to flank with though, this is a bit less useful, since you can almost certainly tumble into a flank with that ally. So if your party has a lot of frontline characters that will often be in positions where you can flank with them, then this is a lot less useful unfortunately. If you're in a situation where you don't have allies to flank with though, this can be a fantastic way of applying flank while also getting panache at the same time. Unbalancing finisher is the first finisher that you can get from feats, and it can be very very useful. Upon hitting with an unbalancing finisher, the target is now flat-footed until the end of your next turn on top of all of the normal bonus damage that you get from performing a finisher. Then playing flat-footed will help out your entire party, including any ranged marshal or spellcaster that you might have in that party. Since it lasts to the end of your next turn, you can also benefit from it on your next turn if you're trying to hit them with another finisher. If you can keep on hitting a target with a finisher every turn, you can keep them flat-footed for as long as they're alive, which can really, really help out everyone in the party. Flat-footed is a very, very useful condition to have on enemies, and for certain enemies, it's really, really hard to actually get them to be flat-footed. Whether that's from some kind of ability that they have, or a special quality of the creature type. Unbalancing finisher is generally an upgrade from Confident Finisher if you hit, although Confident Finisher is still a bit more reliable if you really need to deal damage. The Flamboyant Athlete feat at level 4 is rather interesting. You have to be an expert in athletics to take it, but it grants you a lot of new abilities. First, whenever you're in Panache, you get a climb and swim speed equal to half of your land speed. Considering how Vivacious speed constantly increases as you level up, these climb and swim speeds can get to be really, really fast actually. You can be pretty damn maneuverable in all types of different terrain. The other benefit that you get is that the DCs for high jumps and long jumps decrease by 10, which makes succeeding on them substantially easier. Now a high jump is a DC 20 instead of a DC 30, which makes a really, really big difference. Your long jumps also basically get a 10 foot bonus as to how far they go considering how the DC for long jumps work, though you still can't go further than your speed. The last bonus is pretty simple. You move 5 feet further with a normal leap action, and you can leap 5 feet into the air rather than the normal, I think, 2 or 3 feet. Of these three different bonuses, you're almost certainly going to be getting the most use out of the climb and swim speed though, because leaping is nice and having additional bonuses for that is great, but you're more likely going to be climbing or swimming, and just having bonuses to those is always going to be appreciated. To continue the trend of swashbucklers getting really, really strong reactions, Guardian's Deflection is a super great way to protect your allies. The way that Guardian's Deflection is worded, it is actually impossible to waste it. It simply allows for you to give an ally a plus 2 circumstance bonus to their AC, but you can only give it whenever that plus 2 circumstance bonus would change a hit into a miss or a critical hit into a normal hit. So basically you can negate critical hits and you can also negate misses, and you can do this 
every single turn, but only to allies that are within your reach, so getting a reach weapon will allow you to use this on a lot more people and free up your positioning a lot. Not being able to waste the reaction is so, so useful, since swashbucklers can get access to so many different types of reactions that it's going to be a pretty contested thing of what reaction do you want to use every turn. Not being able to waste it means that you will never think, oh well, I wish I hadn't used it on that, because it did nothing. You will never be able to waste it, and although do keep in mind that this won't stack with any allies who have shields up as both are circumstance bonuses, but it is still a fantastic way to mitigate damage. Impaling Finisher is an incredibly strong finisher, though it does rely on enemy positioning, which does limit its usefulness a bit. Effectively, you make a finisher against two different enemies in a line, even though one of those enemies is probably not going to be within your reach. You only roll the attack roll once, and then you compare the result to both creatures' AC and then you deal damage based on whether or not you hit them. Unsurprisingly, this is absolutely incredible. Finishers can be some of the highest damaging attacks in the entire game, but since you can only make them once per round, most swashbucklers aren't going to be the best at fighting large numbers of enemies. Being able to target two creatures with a finisher, without increasing your multiple attack penalty, all for one action is insanely powerful. It can be hard to get enemies into the particular position that you need though. The shove action can help you out a bit with this, and your allies can always help get enemies in position for your finisher. Talk with your party about it. If you get a barbarian with you, they might not mind shoving people around into a proper positioning. Just communicate about things, and if you can, try and get this off as much as you can, because it can really mess some people up. Leading Dance is another feat that is mostly meant for battle dancers, but all swashbucklers can get some use out of it. You have to be trained in performance to take it, but it can be very useful at getting enemies where you want them to be, or getting enemies to be where they don't want to be. It takes an action, but then you choose an adjacent enemy and roll a performance check against their will DC. On a critical success, you both move 10 feet in the same direction and end adjacent to each other. Neither of your movements triggers reactions from the other person, although your movement can trigger reactions from other enemies nearby. The enemy's movement will never trigger a reaction due to it being forced movement. If you only succeed on the performance check, then you both only, then you both only move 5 feet instead of 10 feet. If you fail, you may move 5 feet, but you don't get the enemy to follow your movement. If you critically fail, then you end up falling prone, as your own moves were too much for you. This can be super useful for getting enemies where you want them to be, and it gets even better for battle dancers. If a battle dancer succeeds on this check, they enter panache. This is incredibly helpful for battle dancers that pick up finishers that require specific enemy positions, and it can really help you shape the battlefield however you want. Have you ever been ambushed without your weapon drawn? It sucks, doesn't it? Well, with the Swaggering Initiative feat, that will never happen again. It gives you a plus two circumstance bonus on initiative checks, and you also get a free action to interact to draw a weapon. This means that you cannot get caught with your pants down, as you will always have a weapon in hand. This is basically the Incredible Initiative feat, since both give you a plus two circumstance bonus to initiative. It's up to you if you want to take this, as it won't necessarily be useful in all combats, because if you know that you're going to be in a dangerous situation, you're probably going to have your weapon out and draw it outside of combat. But in those situations where you do get ambushed and you do really, really need your weapon out, this can help you out substantially. So it's up to you if you want to take a feat that you might not get a huge amount of benefit from most of the time. The bonus to initiative is always going to be nice, but you can always get that with a general feat. So it's up to you if you want to spend a class feat on this. It can really, really be useful in certain situations though. The Twin Parry feat fills a similar function to the Dueling Parry feat or Buckler Expertise, which were level 1 feats. It allows you to spend an action to increase your AC against other attacks that are made against you. It only gives you a plus one though, unless you have a parry weapon in hand and win it, then it becomes a plus two. 
This is really nice for increasing your survivability, especially because you'll kind of need it if you have two weapons in hand because then you don't have any other options for defending yourself. Agile Maneuvers is a really interesting feat that can change up how especially a gymnast swashbuckler plays. It requires that you're an expert in athletics, but it reduces the multiple attack penalty by one for all of your grapple trips and shoves. Now tripping someone after grappling them is a lot more viable and has a much, much higher success rate. This is doubly true if you're in panache and you get your circumstance bonus to those checks that you know, would normally put you in panache as a gymnast. I'll also point out that this is one of the only ways that I know to reduce the multiple attack penalty for these actions, so it's a really great feat to pick up with a swashbuckler multi-class archetype. A monk can make great use out of this, especially with the flurry of maneuvers feat. I'll be going over that whenever I eventually get around to making one of these videos for the monk. At 6th level, swashbucklers can also pick up attack of opportunity. There isn't a whole lot to say here, as attacks of opportunities are amazing, and picking it up is easily worth a 6 level feat. There isn't a whole lot to really talk about when it comes to attack of opportunity, because it's fairly basic, and it's amazing. It would probably be your most consistent offensive reaction when compared to opportune repost, and it can really help you out. Enemies are going to be moving around a lot, so being able to get additional attacks on them will always be nice. Combination Finisher is a weird feat, as it reduces the multiple attack penalty of all of your finishers by one, even if it already has the Agile trait. This is especially good for gymnast swashbucklers, as it makes tripping, grappling, or shoving someone, then immediately using a finisher on them in the same turn, much less likely to fail. I still do generally recommend trying to avoid making finishers when you have a multiple attack penalty if at all possible, but this makes it much more manageable. The other styles can make good use out of this, but as gymnasts are going to be using a lot more actions with the attack trait, I feel it fits a little bit better for them, but everyone can make good use out of it. Precise Finisher upgrades your confident finisher to be even more consistent, and it can really help you out in a pinch. Normally, when you miss with confident finisher, you deal half your precise strike damage regardless of how you missed. Now, if you take precise finisher, you deal your entire precise strike damage rather than having to half it. This is really great since half damage may not be enough to take down whatever you're fighting. Doubling it greatly increases the chance that it will be impactful and take down an enemy. Also, once you get the Eternal Confidence feature at level 19, this bonus applies to all of your finishers, meaning all finishers deal full precise strike damage on a miss. Now, that's only if you actually get to level 19, which I understand that a lot of campaigns won't, but it's still pretty nice for whenever you do have this. Stella's Stab and Snag is a rather weird feat, and not just because it's uncommon. It's the only swashbuckler feat that synergizes with the thievery skill, and it's a bit of a weird one even at that. You have to be an expert in thievery to take it, and it allows you to spend two actions to stride, strike, and then steal from the person that you stabbed. You might be able to at least get something useful from the person, but the general way that most Pathfinder games operate is that you knock the person out before you start to try and loot them. Also, the steal action is pretty limited unless you take the pickpocket skill feat. Now, this can be situationally useful, and it is really flavorful for a more kind of, you know, criminal sort of swashbuckler. But it is kind of weirdly situational, and it does have to contend with a lot of other really good feats at level 6. Also, increasing your thievery to expert by this point means that you're not prioritizing any other skills, so it might be a bit harder for you to be in finesse but it's entirely up to you to whether or not you want to take this as a slight decrease in effectiveness, but it is very flavorful. Vexing Tumble is a great way to get panache, especially if you're in a combat with creatures that have reactions that allow you to hit you whenever you move. You can spend an action and move up to half your speed, and you roll an acrobatics check, comparing your result to every foe's reflex DC whose reach you are moving through. If you get a critical success versus a creature's reflex DC, then you don't trigger any reactions from your movement, and they are flat-footed to you until the end of this turn, and you also get panache. If you only succeed against their reflex DC, then you still don't trigger reactions, 
and you still get panache. If you fail, then you move up to half your speed normally. If you critically fail, however, then you immediately stop moving whenever you enter that creature's reach. And if you start the movement in their reach, then you don't get to move at all. This is a great way to get panache, since trying to tumble through enemies can be very hazardous to your health. Also, half a swashbuckler's speed can be really significant, because as you level up you keep on getting faster and faster and faster. Bleeding Finisher is a crazy strong finisher, and it is one of the best ways to apply bleed damage in the entire game. It's pretty simple actually. Upon hitting with a bleeding finisher, you deal persistent bleed damage equal to the amount of precision damage that you normally deal with your finishers. At level 8, that means you're dealing 3d6 bleed damage, but increases to 46 at level 9, and up to 66 by the time you hit level 20. This is a truly crazy amount of persistent damage, and you don't sacrifice anything else to dish it out. Persistent damage can be incredibly powerful if utilized early in an encounter and adds multiple turns to, you know, deal damage. And with Bleeding Finisher, you can just run around the combat giving every single person bleed. Persistent damage will probably only last a couple of rounds though, but you can still deal a lot of damage with it when it's this much persistent damage. If you've been wielding two weapons this entire time, then Dual Finisher is exactly what you've been waiting for. It's a single action finisher that allows you to make two strikes, one with each weapon in a different hand and targeting two different creatures. If the second strike doesn't have the agile trait or that weapon doesn't have the agile trait, then it takes a minus two penalty, but the important part is that your multiple attack penalty doesn't increase until after both attacks are made. As both of these attacks are finishers and deal stupid amounts of damage, you can reliably do more damage with dual finisher than most other finisher types in the game, but the big drawing point is that you can target two creatures. Most finishers can only target one person, and because you can only make one per round, it means that generally swashbucklers aren't going to be very good at fighting large numbers of creatures, but dual finisher can easily fight multiple people at the same time. There is a slight problem though, because it means that you won't have a free hand, which does limit your actions, especially if you're a gymnast swashbuckler. Since you need a free hand to grapple, trip, or shove, you can't do that if you have a weapon in your hand, so it limits the way that you can get panache for gymnasts specifically, but for all the other styles it's fantastic. The real power of dual finisher when compared to something like impaling finisher is how much easier it is to actually pull off since you have to be either adjacent to the creatures that you're attacking or have a reach weapon when you can really, really pull off dual finisher easily. Regardless, it is a very, very strong feat, and I highly recommend that you check out the idea of a dual wielding swashbuckle. Flamboyant Cruelty is a rather confusing rare feat, and it only really fits for particularly cruel characters. If you love to kick people when they're down, then this is great for you. Its effects are pretty simple. Whenever you make a melee weapon strike against someone with at least two conditions from the following list of clumsy, drained, enfeebled, frightened, sickened, and stupefied, you get a circumstance bonus to your damage rolls equal to the number of conditions that that creature is suffering from. Additionally, you get a plus one circumstance bonus on checks to tumble through and your style specific actions to get panache until the end of your turn, but only if they're targeting the enemy that you attacked. This is alright. The main issue with it is that most swashbucklers don't have a lot of ways to naturally apply these conditions, so you'll really have to go out of your way to get a way to apply these, or you're going to have to rely on your allies debuffing everyone else in the combat for you. Even once you do get the benefits of this feat, the bonus to damage isn't going to be all that high most likely. The boost to actions that can give you panache is useful though, but you might not be able to get it very often, because really swashbucklers just don't have a lot of ways to apply these conditions. Nimble Roll is an upgrade to the Nimble Dodge reaction, allowing you to now add a bonus to your reflex saves in addition to your AC. Also if you use Nimble Dodge and the attack misses you, or you succeed on the triggering reflex save, then you can also move up to 10 feet as part of the reaction. This movement can be incredibly helpful, although it does still trigger reactions if you're in a combat where that matters. 
It can help you get away from enemies, which can really reduce the amount of danger and in total. If you are thinking about taking Nimble Roll, though, to help protect you from effects that need reflex saves, I'm just going to quickly point out two things. First, Charmed Life is available at level 2, and you can use Charmed Life to get a bonus to all saving throws that is equal to the Nimble Roll bonus, so if you want a bonus to saving throws, you should probably just take Charmed Life, because it's a similar effect. Second, your reflex saves are the best in the game, so you aren't actually all that likely to need a bonus to your reflex saves to be able to succeed. The movement is really what you're here for, as it can be really nice for positioning and getting away from enemies. So make sure that you use that tactically and smart. Now that we've hit level 8, we can finally get the first feat that actually cares about your Swashbuckler class DC. Stunning Finisher is incredibly effective. But keep in mind that it has the incapacitation trait, so it won't be nearly as useful against higher level enemies than your own. Effectively, Stunning Finisher, whenever you hit a target, they must make a fortitude save against your class DC. This has the incapacitation trait, so if they're above your level, then they get one degree of zest better. It's the incapacitation trait, it's standard across the entire system. If they critically succeed, then nothing happens at all, and they're pretty lucky. If they only normal succeed, then they can't use any reactions until the start of their next turn. If they fail, then they're stunned, losing one action and also being unable to perform reactions until the start of their next turn. If they critically fail, however, they are stunned three, losing all three actions until the beginning of their next turn. And then whenever it gets to that turn, it takes up all three of their actions and then it's no longer their turn anymore. The crazy part about Stunning Finisher is that once a creature is affected by it, they're not immune to it. Meaning that you can likely force someone to make this save every single turn, and you're going to be eating actions from them eventually. Stunned is obviously a very strong condition, as taking away actions is probably the best way to reduce a creature's effectiveness, and being able to apply it with a finisher will always be useful, because you're going to be dealing a lot of damage with the finisher in addition to maybe making them stunned. I have a bit of an issue with Vivacious Bravado, unfortunately, because it feels like a second level feat, which is never a good thing for an 8th level feat to feel like. Essentially, on a turn where you gained Panache, you can spend an action to temporarily gain hit points equal to your Charisma modifier, and these are of course temporary hit points, so you use them first. And these only last until the start of your next turn. My main issue is that there are almost certainly going to be better things to use an action on that can be a way to reduce the amount of damage you'll take. For example, dueling parry or any other action that you have that increases your AC will lead you to not being hit as much or not being crit as much, which will greatly reduce the amount of damage you take. And you can always just take a step away from the person that you're next to. At this level, your Charisma modifier is only going to be a plus 3 or 4 most likely, and 3 or 4 temporary hit points aren't much at all at this level, so it doesn't add up to being very significant. Personally, if I had a swashbuckler in a game that I was GMing, I would house rule this to be a free action whenever you enter Panache. So you could get a little bit of a buffer whenever you enter Panache without having to spend an action on it. Either way, it can be situationally useful, but those situations are going to be few and far between. Buckler Dance is a stance that you can enter as long as you're wielding a buckler, no surprise there. While in this stance, you constantly have your buckler raised, giving you its AC bonus. This saves you a lot of action throughout a combat, as you no longer have to spend an action to raise a shield every turn. And you only have to spend one action on probably the first turn of combat. The boost to AC is never going to be anything to turn down, but it does get a lot more appealing if you take Buckler Expertise at level 1, as that increases the AC bonus to a plus 2 from a plus 1. This is good, it has great action economy, yeah, take it if you like bucklers. Daring Dew is the start of an insane set of feats with the Fortune trait, that give Swashbucklers a very different way of engaging in combat. Basically, you can compound your panache together, getting an even better at performing actions that would put you in panache when you're in panache. If you're in panache and you perform an action, that you would get a plus one circumstance bonus on it due to it being an action that would put you in panache, you can roll twice and take the better. 
This has the fortune trait, and it's absurdly powerful and greatly increases your chance of success. Though, how useful this will be to you does depend a lot on your style. In particular, I like Daring Do for gymnasts, since being able to roll twice and take the better on trips, grapples, and shoves is incredibly useful. For a lot of other different styles, they only have one or two actions that they can use with Daring Do, and they aren't necessarily super strong. But for gymnasts, tripping, grappling, and shoving can be exceptionally powerful, but you might not have the greatest chance of success. This is especially true for grappling, as if you critically succeed, a target being restrained is so, so much more powerful than them simply being grabbed. If you can just grapple someone every single turn of a combat and keep them restrained, their actions are so much more limited. The interesting thing about Daring Do to me is that you're less incentivized to make finishers, as you want to be able to stay in panache to continue to perform actions that you get the ability to roll twice on. It puts you into more of a supportive role, which is a really interesting place for a martial character to be, so I find it really fascinating. Dueling Dance is similar to Buckler Dance, and it requires that you have the dueling parry feat. It's a stance, and while you're in that stance, you constantly gain the benefits of dueling parry, but if you ever don't have the requirements of dueling parry, you immediately leave the stance. So basically, always keep a weapon in one hand, and always have a free hand. It's not super complicated. Similarly to Buckler Dance, though, this is a great boost in you know, survivability and action economy. It's really great if you want a defensive option that will increase your survivability, then you can't go wrong with dueling dance. Reflexive Repost makes it a bit easier to choose how to be using your reactions, as it gives you an additional reaction every turn that you can only use for opportune repost. Now you'll be able to use opportune repost whenever you're given the opportunity to without having to worry about using up your reaction that you might want to use for your other reactions that you can get access to. This is also the start of a series of feats that allow you to improve your opportune repost further and further and further. So if you like being able to counterattack other people whenever they attack you and intend to take those other feats, I really recommend taking reflexive repost because it gives you a lot of flexibility. Targeting finisher is for people who want to be able to target specific body parts to apply debuffs. The debuff only lasts until the end of your next turn, but on a critical hit, you also apply a lesser debuff that lasts for a full minute, which is probably going to be the rest of the combat. It's a normal finisher, so you deal full finisher damage on top of all of these debuffs, but let's just go over the debuffs real quick because they're not too complicated. If you hit a limb that they use for an attack, like say an arm or a tentacle, they are enfeebled 2 for 1 round. If you critically hit them, then they are enfeebled 1 for a minute. If you hit their head, then they are stupefied 2 until the end of your next turn, and they are stupefied 1 for a minute if you critically hit them. If you hit their heads, then they have a minus 10 foot penalty to all of their speeds, or a minus 5 foot penalty to all of their speeds for 1 minute on a critical hit. The speed penalty is pretty situational, as it isn't actually that large of a speed penalty, but the other benefits can be really nasty. Although do keep in mind that if you run into an enemy that uses dexterity for its attack rolls, like as a finesse weapon, you can't apply clumsy with this feat, meaning that you can't actually reduce their attack rolls. But if you run into a big bruiser, then yeah, enfeebled will reduce their attack rolls, which is a great way to, you know, lower their damage and to hit. If you run into a situation where you don't know what to apply, Stupefied will always be useful considering how it reduces their will saves. Your other allies will thank you, and if you're a braggart swashbuckler, that just makes demoralizing someone even easier. Targeting Finisher is a great way to apply some debuffs to targets, so I really recommend that you check it out. To continue the trend of swashbucklers getting incredible defensive reactions, swashbucklers can literally cheat death. Whenever you take damage that would reduce you to zero hit points, you can spend a reaction to remain at one hit point and increase your doom condition instead of actually dying. You can't ignore or reduce this doom condition in any way, but it is a great way to just say no to death. This doom condition also goes away after just 10 minutes, so it's almost certainly going to be gone by the time that you get to another fight, 
if you take the time to heal up, which you probably should because you're going to be at one hit point. There are going to be certain effects that you can't cheat your way out of that don't actually deal damage, like Power Word Kill, which just sets your hit points to zero, rather than dealing damage, but those are going to be few and far between. Taking the Cheat Death Feat is a great way to, you know, improve the survivability of your character, but there is one big limitation that you need to keep track of, which is you can only do this once per round. If an enemy takes you down to zero hit points with its first attack, and then you stay up with Cheat Death, it might just hit you again, which you can't cheat that again, so you might be putting yourself into a bit more danger by cheating death, which I feel is fair for a feat of this caliber. Mobile Finisher is an extraordinarily feat for being a level 12 feat, but it is still good. As one action, you can stride and then strike, and because this has the finisher trait, that strike does a ton of bonus damage. If you have any other movement speeds, then you can use those movement types instead of normally striding. Because technically, flying and climbing and swimming and burrowing are all different actions than stride, which is actually something to keep in mind if you have any other feats that allow you to stride. Getting two actions for one is always going to be useful, and getting to approach a creature then attack it is going to be very, very useful, especially considering how fast you can be. You can mobile finisher to move up to someone, then stab them, then tumble through that person to move on to someone else. It allows you to really just be a hyper, hyper mobile marshal, which is always going to be a lot of fun. Mobile finisher is not complex, but it really, really doesn't need to be. It does what it says on the tin. It's a very mobile finisher. Flamboyant leap is a really interesting way of dealing with creatures that are flying. You have to be a master in athletics, and you also have to ha have the flamboyant athlete feat, and it allows you to jump and make a finisher at the same time. For two actions, you can leap, make a high jump, or make a long jump. Somewhere in the middle of that jump, you can make any finisher that you have that doesn't include any movement, so basically any finisher that is not mobile finisher. After performing that finisher, you immediately fall to the ground, and you don't take any fall damage if you don't fall further than your jump. Additionally, if you're making a high jump, then you can calculate the DC as a long jump, meaning that if you want to hit a creature that is 30 feet in the air and you're jumping straight up, you only have to make a DC 30 athletics check to jump that high, which by level 14 should be really achievable. Also, whether or not you're making a long jump or a high jump, the maximum distance that you can move is now equal to double your speed rather than, you know, just your speed. This allows you to jump really, really high, which I'm always going to be down for. This is a great way of dealing with flying enemies, but it won't be quite as useful if other people in your party have a way to allow you to fly or if you have an item that allows you to fly. So. It, it's all up to you whether or not you think that this is worth it. Now that we're getting into the higher level feats, we are really starting to get to the kind of silly feats and I love it so much. Impossible Repost is very funny, and it extends Opportune Repost to be able to be used on pretty much every single type of attack. Now you can use Opportune Repost against any attack that critically misses you, even if they aren't in your reach. You still make an attack roll as you deflect some of the attack back at the source with all the bonuses that you would normally have on that attack roll. If you hit, you deal the normal amount of damage for your weapon, but the weapon type changes as appropriate. As an example, if someone were to critically miss you with a reduced flame and then you hit them with the, you know, deflection, you would do fire damage instead of the normal damage type for your weapon. The funny part to me is that there is no listed range, meaning that if someone with a longbow shot at you from a thousand feet away, the maximum range of a longbow, your counterattack would be made with no distance penalty, so you can just knock an arrow back a thousand feet, and I find that hilarious. Perfect Finisher is another feat with the fortune trait. It's a super basic finisher with no additional effects but it doesn't need any other effects. Rolling twice and taking the better on a finisher attack roll is terrifying, since double damage finishers can be some of the highest damage in the entire game. Rolling twice and taking the better 
greatly increases the chance of getting those high damage crits, and I feel that Perfect Finisher is the most consistent damage dealing finisher that Swashbucklers can get access to. Especially once you get to level 19 and get the additional effect of Confident Finisher on your Perfect Finishers. Twin Defense is very similar to Buckler Dance and Dueling Dance, in that it is a stance that you can enter that gives you the constant effects of Twin Parry. I won't be talking very much about Twin Defense, outside of saying that it's a very good action economy and helps you have better survivability, as I've gone over both of those other feats in a bit more detail, so if you want to check out Twin Defense, check out those. It's pretty much the same thing, but four levels higher. Deadly Grace doubles down on how Splashbucklers have probably the highest critical hit damage by allowing you to double the amount of dice from the Deadly Trait. For those of you not in the know, the Deadly Trait gives you an additional die that you roll whenever you critically hit something, but you don't double that damage die. Now you effectively do, since you roll twice the number of dice. The Deadly Trait gets even better as you get Striking Runes, and this feat makes that even better. By the time you hit level 16, you probably have at least a greater striking room, meaning that you'll be dealing 4 deadly dice rather than the normal 2. Additionally, this goes up to 6 deadly dice with a major striking room. If you like rolling lots and lots and lots of dice, then the deadly grace feat is for you. Have you ever wanted to just not miss with opportune repost ever again? Well, now you can, because Felicia's repost allows you to roll twice and take the better on every opportune repost attack roll. I've talked about before a lot in this video on how strong the ability to roll twice and take the better is, so I'm not going to be spending a lot of time talking about this. It's fantastic. You know how good it is by this point. Speaking of incredible fortune effects, Incredible Luck turns the Charmed Life reaction into the best defensive reaction in the entire game in my opinion. Now, whenever you use the Charmed Life reaction, you roll twice and take the better on the saving throw that you spent Charmed Life on, which really just makes up for not having a good will or fort save. Now you have a huge bonus on pretty much any save that you want to spend a reaction on. I've talked a lot about in this video about how strong fortune effects are, so you really by this point should know how good this is. Being able to roll twice and take the better on a saving throw, in my opinion, is better than being able to roll twice and take the better on an attack roll. So this is absurdly good. Lethal Finisher is exactly what it sounds like. It is the most damaging finisher in the entire game. Upon hitting someone with the Lethal Finisher, they have to make a Fortitude save, and it's a very important one. If your strike was a critical hit, then the enemy gets one degree worse on that save, which is really, really bad for them. Instead of the normal finisher damage that you deal, the amount of damage depends on the result of their fortitude save. If they get a critical success, then they only take six precision damage, which is hardly anything. If they succeed on the fortitude save, then you get to deal your normal precision damage for this level, which is 66 precision damage. If they fail though, then we start to get into the fun territory, because you're now dealing 12d6 precision damage, rather than, you know, the normal 66 for this level. And if they critically fail, god help them, because they're about to take 18d6 precision damage. That is a very, very stupid amount of damage, and you can completely obliterate someone that you hit if it goes right. Also, it's very reasonable that this has the death trait, meaning that anyone that you hit with it will just die if they go down to zero hit points. There is one element of this feat that I'm not exactly sure about, so I'd be interested to see your thoughts on it. I'm pretty sure that whenever you critically hit someone with this finisher, you don't double any of the precision damage that you deal based on their fortitude save. Meaning if, say, you critically hit someone, and then they also critically fail on their saving throw, you don't double the 18d6 precision damage, because that seems way too good to be true. Overall, Lethal Finisher is terrifying. It does a horrific amount of damage and can really, really mess up someone's day. But it is a gamble, 
because it relies on the fortitude save of people that you're fighting, there's a chance that this might just not be as good as a normal finisher. People's fortitude saves are generally very, very high, so it's up to you whether or not you want to take the risk. The parry and riposte feat makes opportune riposte far, far more likely to trigger, even though it only allows you to get its effects against one enemy at a time. That enemy is chosen by a couple of different requirements. First, you must have hit that enemy with a finisher since, you know, your last turn. Additionally, you have to be benefiting from a bonus to your AC from the parry trait, dueling parry, or twin parry. But whenever you meet these conditions, you can use opportune repost whenever that enemy misses you, rather than requiring them to critically miss you. This is really, really fantastic in fights against single enemies, as it allows you to use opportune repost far, far more often and get more use out of any feats that you've taken that improve the reaction. It does have a lot less utility in fights against large numbers of enemies though, which is of course a bit of a weakness of the swashbuckler. But it is still very useful and for like boss fights or something, it can really, really make you a lot more effective. The inexhaustible counter moves feat at level 20 is pretty simple. Every single enemy turn, you get an extra reaction that you can only use to perform an opportune repost against that enemy or an attack of opportunity if you grab that feat. This can be really, really useful if you're fighting against large numbers of enemies, though it isn't a very complicated or really mechanically complex feat. If you end up taking ex inexhaustible counter moves, I really recommend grabbing a reach weapon of some kind, because being able to have reach makes attack of opportunity much, much more likely to trigger. And ideally, you want to be able to try and trigger that every single round whenever the opportunity presents itself. Now you're never going to run out of reactions, and that is a very fun feeling to have for someone with so many damn reactions. Almost all marshals have a feat like the Panache Paragon feat at level 20, where you get the ability to be permanently quickened. Panache Paragon does, like most of them, only allow particular types of actions with the quickened action, and Panache Paragon seems pretty limited, but it is limited in a pretty good way because it's limited with, you know, stuff that you're going to be doing pretty much every turn or anyway. You can only use the additional action to tumble through, or use a skill action that is related to your style that gives you panache, or to just do something random that your GM says, okay, that'll give you panache. So basically, you have an additional action every turn to get panache with. This is pretty limited considering that most other martial classes can attack with their quickened action, but you can't. But normally, the main way that your action economy gets restricted is getting panache. That's just a problem that swashbucklers will face from levels 1 to 20. And at level 20, Panache Paragon makes it so much easier to get panache because you have additional actions that are dedicated to doing it. The last feat that I'm going to be going over is a spoiler for the Fists of the Ruby Phoenix AP. So if you want to avoid spoilers, then you can skip the final section of this video. I won't actually be going into detail on how this is included into the story of the AP, but it's up to you to make that call. Now that that is out of the way, let's talk about Vivacious Afterimage. It is a super, super interesting feat that really does feel like a 20th level ability. Whenever you move, you can instead use Vivacious Afterimage and use Stride and you can stop at any point. If you stop early or early on in your movement, you can instead have an after image of you continue further along through the movement, stopping at any point that you could have gotten to whenever you started. This after image is an illusion. So it's not actually you but people think that it is you. You can also create illusions halfway through movements. So you can like drop an after image of yourself. If anyone interacts with these after images, they get a will save against your class DC to try and disbelieve the illusion. But if they have not disbelieved against the illusion, then these after images count for flanking. 
Now, I do wish that there were some other mechanical benefits for this, because getting flanking is not actually all that strong for a 20th level feat, despite how cool the feat itself is. There are so many ways to apply flat-footed, especially at 20th level, that I think that maybe something else could have been a bit more interesting. But regardless, it is a very, very cool feat that is really, really fun. Overall, I think that it should be clear by this point that I love swashbuckler feats, considering how I've been raving about them for about an hour now. There are only a few feats that I feel are mechanically subpar, and pretty much all of them ooze flavor from everything that they do. There are so many different ways that you can build a swashbuckler that I can easily say that I could build five different swashbucklers and end up with characters that don't seem remotely similar and could play in very different ways. The later levels having a lot more feats that improve opportune repost really lives up to the idea of a counteracting character and really makes for an interesting idea for how to play one, although I do wish that there were some lower level feats for that kind of playstyle, because a playstyle kicking in at level 10 is a really long time to wait. Outside of that though, I don't have any complaints. I love the Swashbucker class as a whole, and I hope that you've learned something today and in the previous video. Thanks for watching this. This has been a monumental undertaking to make, and I hope that you have really enjoyed it. If you have, I'd really appreciate a like and comment down below on pretty much anything that you want. Those determine a lot of how my content gets treated by the algorithm, so any help there is greatly appreciated. I have been putting out two videos a week about Pathfinder 2nd Edition, so if you'd like to see more of that, then feel free to subscribe, it'll help it get recommended to you. Until I see you next, live a wonderful life.